Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Jordan Nelson and I'll be your host for today's one hour webinar called Math Games Galore for Elementary K-5. to I'm one of several customer engagement managers at NASCO Education and we provide K-Career to Career solutions. Maybe you've heard of us, maybe you haven't, and that's okay. Either way, my goal is to make sure that you leave this webinar with new insight and can use it for your own needs. With that being said, as attendees are signing onto the webinar, I did want to mention to everyone how you can communicate with me today. You'll see on the webinar control panel, there are there is a questions tab, and this is how you can ask questions, write comments, and interact with me throughout this webinar. Since I have a lot to cover and I wanna maximize your time, I'm gonna answer questions at the very end, but feel free to introduce yourselves and or add comments along the way in the questions tab. And also keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded and you'll have access to it about two hours after the presentation. And you'll want to fill out the survey too at the end um, as well, because we use this feedback to improve our webinar. So with that said, um, we're going to uh, dive right into the meat of this presentation. So agenda. Um, Here's the agenda, what we're gonna do for today. Um, we're gonna be, uh, give you a quick overview of games in general. Most of you already use a variety of games or, and or are looking for other games to use with your students, but we'll cover some aspects and resources that maybe you haven't discussed or thought of. Um, we're also going to be covering something called Minute to Win It. I recorded a separate webinar on this topic, but this is also something that can be related to fun and interactive games you can do with students either at home or in the classroom. We're going to be focusing on math concepts um, that you can use with this strategy. Uh, next, we'll be leading into our conversation into Knowledge Hook, an interactive guidance system that really works well with incorporating games and engaging components for students learning and driving student outcomes. And then we'll be wrapping up with uh, Q&A. So um, this is the webinar. Um, it's gonna feel pretty fast paced because it, again, it's only one hour and there's a lot we're gonna be covering. But what we're trying to achieve today is exposure to a lot of different resources and ideas that you can use immediately following the webinar. So let's have some fun um, and let's jump right into the meat of this presentation. Uh, math instruction using games. Using games isn't necessarily a new concept to the classroom. Growing up, I remember a lot of different games we played in school. Simon Says, Red Rover, Heads Up, Seven Up, Twister, Oregon Trail, etc. And as I reflect on my own education, I know that some were more educational than others, right? So some were just fillers for time fill. You know, uh, some were used for building a positive classroom environment uh, by having students interact socially. And so there was a variety of different uses for games. And even today, the games are shifting. Um, instead of using like, you know, Bingo or Jeopardy, now they're using things like Minecraft, Sims, and like Carmen San Diego on Google Earth. It's not to say the quote unquote older games are antiquated, uh, but the advancement of technology, it's only natural that the games coming out now are more advanced and sophisticated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're more educational. It's just that we're going to be focusing on a lot of our discussion on that today. So there's many different types of games out there, but I've more or less kind of bundled games into two areas. One, the first area is interactive or storyline games, meaning there's a plot and story along with the game that the student engages with when playing. You know, you gain levels, power-ups, new information about how to solve the main problem, et cetera. Uh, these types of games typically take the longest to implement and use in the classroom, but there's good benefits of using them if used correctly. Um, the second type of game is most traditional in the classroom. It's your classic game that teaches you how to play the game by giving the rules or instructions in the beginning. And then as you play, you become more familiar and get better over time. It's, it's a game designed to teach something usually specific like addition, subtraction, multiplication, decimals, et cetera. And its purpose is to mainly enrich the curriculum or lesson that was done to help students hone their skills. Uh, the LEN, you know, the last area uh, revolves around simply pure entertainment. These games typically have little to no educational value and the focus is students who are bored and want something to do, right? These, these can be deceptive to educators because it might appear that students are engaged, but there really isn't learning happening. Games can be disruptive or seen as barriers to learning if not managed or implemented properly. 
and we'll get into those in more detail throughout this presentation as well. But I want to emphasize that each of these different areas are not truly representative of everything out there, but represent what I've come up with. Within each of these areas, you can have incentives tied into the game. You can have it delivered digitally with like an iPad, Chromebook, a computer browser like Firefox or Internet. Uh, Explore or Chrome, et cetera, or it could be, you know, quote, unquote, old school with paper and materials laminated and used over and over again. So either way, there's a lot of, lot out there and there's many different types of games to explore and learn about. So where do you start? What are the best options out there? What should you be looking for? These are the kind of questions we're going to cover throughout uh, this webinar today. So math games, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's talk about the pros and cons and everything in between. It's, it's good to go through some of this and also realize this doesn't list all the pros, uh, but it gets you thinking about what games can do in the classroom. Oftentimes, students are presented with a problem that they have to solve. They need to get into you know, point A to point B, There's but there's obstacles in the way. So students are kind of quote unquote stuck in with solving how they're going to travel the distance needed to move to the next level. They're, they're sometimes limited on how they can move, when they can move, what they can use along the way, et cetera. So students instinctively go through this thought process and solving the problem without realizing they're synthesizing information and making informed decisions based about how to solve a problem. So, um, and then research has been done for a long time around assessment, both formative and summative. Games can also be used with these types of assessment if built correctly, and it can be used to better student outcomes if done effectively. Uh, there's a lot of studies around student outcomes from using games with instruction, anywhere from increasing engagement and concentration, teaching cooperation, critical thinking, uh, reasoning and spatial skills, time management and comprehension and evaluation skills. Then there's also the benefit of simulating real world applications and life skills with training. For example, uh, simulating landing a cargo plane or simulating owning a veterinarian shop and taking care of animals where students might learn time management, uh, materialistic value, day-to-day -day activities to run a business, and safety protocols. protocols. Um, all of these are good training po talking points and worth discussion if considering games into the classroom. So let's talk about the cons, right? Uh, one can argue that uh, kids in general already spend too much time using technology, and this is based on their day-to-day -day activity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Students are estimated to be using between seven to eight hours a day using media already. And that's a lot, right? And not only that, but games and or, or video games are seen as kind of a leisurely pastime for students and not considered a way to teach academics. And and, and so more than than just an unproductive activity and distraction to the classroom at home. And this might not be your own personal viewpoint, but this is, does exist out there. And you might have to overcome this in order to use gaming into your instruction. Uh, with curriculum generally uh, being present or in classrooms, it can be hard to find the time to justify using games in the classroom, let alone an educational game that is also fun. Now, some curriculums are designed with games in mind, but then there are others that do not. So it might depend on the situation. Um, Students lack of readiness, and this goes along the lines that all students have different varying degrees of skill and computer literacy. Students have to be able to learn games, and sometimes games are harder for students to learn that tradi than traditional audio visuals. You know, also consider that students can lose the desire to learn in the traditional setting after becoming maybe addicted to gaming, right? We ultimately want students to understand that learning can be fun regardless if it's done with the game or not. You don't hear people often say, you know what? I just hate knowing so much, right? <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Uh, but math games might also have something working against them right from the get-go because many teachers have little to no experience in using games to teach or don't have access and support to work with students alongside games. So games become kind of underutilized. It's, it's important that teachers have training and time dedicated to beat PD uh, to implement games successfully. Just keep in mind though, that school districts have a certain budget and while some are willing to invest in these kind of options, Others are not as fortunate, especially if administration, a principal or a fellow coworker already have a bad stigma towards games to begin with. Um, another, another con um, that is that sometimes games require uh, more than just the time frame allowed to implement a more complex game. 
Uh, sometimes sophisticated games can take more than a couple hours to learn and more time to play. With certain class schedules um, and how to, the back to school adjustments works out, this could leave almost no room to implement games. Budget for an innovation lab with laptops, iPads, Chromebooks, or whatever else that would be needed to explore and discover games can become an issue. There might also be issues with connectivity at home or away from our educational facilities. So this also presents a problem at potential high cost. Also, if you're considering um, paid resources versus free resources. This also could present an issue because more than likely free resources are not as robust as paid ones. Uh, so if your budget is limited, this also might limit your options and present a problem to overcome. You might have to rely on additional funding or grants. So how do you make something happen long term if this is the route you plan to go, right? And then lastly, the relevance to standards, making sure that skills students um, are learning appropriate skills or content. Uh, the last thing you want to do is mislead students. So while you're eager to play a game with them, you want to make sure that it's age appropriate and is providing the appropriate student outcomes you need to address. So sometimes it's unclear. So it takes an intuitive educator to really understand how to utilize a game effectively or more time to dedicate to the area. And let's be honest, who has just extra time sitting around to do extra projects? It just, <laughs> It's it's tough already, um, the adjustments that we've had to make, especially with going to distance learning this year. Uh, so there's a lot to think about. And as we move forward and discuss how games can be incorporated in instruction, um, what we're going to do next is kind of review some games together. And we're going to discuss what we think of them as a group. Um, and this is this is where you can, you can do um, and leave comments in the questions tab as well along the way. And for today's purposes, I was going to focus on free content and resources. Because um, I know that's important to those that are out there right now. Um, also note that as we review these different games, don't worry about writing down the URL or feeling like you're missing out on links. I'll have them in the deck so that you can go back to them later after um, you are sent the recording of this webinar. So let's jump into our first uh, set of lessons. We're going to uh, go to something called um, Math Nook. Um, and so I'm going to exit out of this presentation so you can kind of get a good see or visual of Math Nook. Um, the, the first website, um, like I said, is going to be Math Nook. It's one word. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. And again, that's okay. It's a website. There's a variety of games, the resources you can use. Uh, first thing I want to show you is that you can split up um, by grade level. So it's a little bit easier. Uh, to be able to implement. Now we're K to five, so we'd be focusing on these different tabs right here. Um, what's also nice though, is if you scroll down to the very bottom, what they have here are the Common Core uh, links. So you can easily click on these different links to get um, the Common Core games that are linked to those standards as well. And then they also have skill keys. So this is important. So if you're looking at a game like Geo, this is geometry. When it says skills variety, this might be a variety of different skills. Um, uh, you might have counting, uh, you might have coordinate grids. Um, if you're looking at this, you might see that, oh, this is Evo PRM R&D. What does that mean? Well, that's prime numbers, even odd numbers and rounding. So those are different skills that you might see for different games. So that's that's some that's how this is kind of organized, but I've kind of jumped to different games that we can just jump right into. Um, to be able to use right away. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to, um, I'm gonna actually throw this over here. The first one we're gonna actually do is called Ladybugs Across the Road. Uh, so let's just jump right into the game. Now you can't hear the sound, but essentially what you have are four different ladybugs down here that you're able to move across and you have to, as you can see, match them up with the numbers that you see here. So as I get on there, I hit space bar and then I connect um, to the next one. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully not get run over here. Oh, I did. So then I get another life to be able to keep going. Um, so then I uh, keep going over to the number five. Um, I hit space bar, I'm ready to go. So then I come up here to number six. And again, this is just a very easy way as soon as you know the functions of the game to be able to start interacting with the game itself. Now, um, it says level up, you press the space bar. Um, then you're able to go to the next level. So now we have a little bit harder, right? So we're doing three, right? So now these moving leaves 
um, are going to be able to interact with you. And notice I have to hit space bar in order for it to stop. So one thing that you're going to notice, though, is that as I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to show you a little glitch that I found when I played this. And this, this is something to be aware of with all your students. Now watch what happens when I come up here. Notice I'm in the water, um, but I didn't fall in. Um, this is known as a glitch because if I go up here and I come down, watch, I fall into water. So this, this is something that students can find. So theoretically, students can actually cheat at this game based on this glitch. And so I can come up here um, and I'll do that. But then I'll, I'll just wanted to kind of show you that because students, regardless of the games you play, if there's a glitch in the game, oftentimes, they are going to find it. So that's just something to be aware of when you're playing games. So again, this is an easy counting game that you can use for kindergarten level, make it interactive. But again, if you can find a glitch in a game, um, you can make the difficulty a little bit easier. Now notice I won't get hit by the vehicle, um, but yet I, I'm not falling in the water either. So this is the easy way, but this is just something just to be aware of that you can play for um, the kindergarten level. And so you can play it again, et cetera. Um, the next one we're going to be focusing on is Ladybug Pathway. So uh, we're going to be starting a game. There's two different versions. There's counting and there's measurement. Um, so if we go to counting, what this is doing is saying that, hey, we have to have X amount of paths or uh, that to actually reach this flower. So if I notice that the green highlights where we can actually go with throughout this game. Now I have a different options here. Now if I want to go straight, I can still go straight. Now I have two different other options. And notice that um, as I'm going, this my score is going up, but also how many moves I'm taking as well. So as I'm going through here, notice that if I come back up here, that, oh, wait a minute, I failed, right? So target is 11 pieces, but I done it, I did it in four. So even though I thought I'd solve this problem, I actually did, I didn't take the appropriate number of steps to be able to do this. So then I would go and try it again. Right, and then we'd be able to reset. Um, so then if you go back to into the game as well, um, see, so notice as well, this is one of the errors that I don't like, is that if you're done with the game, you click it, it jumps you automatically out of the game. So even though you send the students the link to it, it, it does push you back out of the game. So if we go back into the um, kindergarten level, we'd have to go right back down into, um, actual game again counting the ladybugs pathway um, just to be able to start this up again so this is this is something just to be aware of whenever you're using free content you'll also notice that sometimes there's more ads and other things commentary on uh, free content that's the other thing that usually you have to kind of worry about so if we start the game we do measurement this is a little bit different in the fact that now we can use a ruler now we have to use 35 inches meaning that from our start to beginning, how many inches are we actually using? You can use a ruler here. So we know if we take this path, that's five inches. Well, then if we took a different path up, how many inches is there, right? And then you can start adding this up so that by the time we get there, we know before we even begin where we should be able to go to be able to equal that distance. Now we currently did three inches, right? So we can do this two ways. We can do it where we can just kind of estimate or we can use it where we're actually using a ruler throughout this process. Now notice that, oh, I'm only at 10, so I have to keep going um, and just to be able to reach my goal of 35 inches. And so I'm just kind of quickly going through here. Now I'm at 25. So notice I didn't measure where to go. So now I'm thinking that, oh, wait a minute, do I, I, I can't go this way now because it's not highlighted. So notice that I can only take one pass. So when I come back down here, I notice that, oh, well, you know what? I only got 29 pieces. And that's the reason why we use a ruler thing. So again, using measurement and it's incorporating into the games. So that is our ladybug um, game that we have there. Okay, um, for first grade, um, oh, sorry, I didn't want me to go back there. Um, I like to go back to the beginning just in case. So this is the other one. So we, we can start the game. Um, this is a, based on what comes next. It's based on patterns. Other things here is this can take you offsite. So this is sponsored by. So if you click here, it takes you offsite. You can change the volume, um, other different aspects. So this is something to be aware of. There's 15 levels. 
Um, each level gives you um, X amount of points, uh, up to uh, 60 points. And so there's a total of 900 points that you can use, but it starts at the very beginning, you know, what comes next, right? So different shapes, different sizes. Notice I get points for correct answers. Um, if I were to use an incorrect answer, I, I lose five points. Um, so at the very end, again, this is going to tell you code score. So I actually played this game earlier, so it's actually keeping track of all that. So that's the other thing. Once you play it, since it's free, it, it does keep track of everything because it's browser based. Um, uh, this also keeps track of time. So depending on how fast you level up, you can keep track of that. So that's like a first grade version. Um, math pickup truck. This is a um, easy one where you can click on coins and you get to the very, your target is 23 cents. So if I were to keep clicking here and notice that the coins are moving and they can fall out um, based on this. So if I go in too fast or if I'm going too slow, I don't, I can speed up, I can turn, I can make a little more. So it's a little bit more engaging, but you're actually counting coins. And at the very end, it actually counts up all of your various coins to see if you're correct or not. So again, a nice little easy game that you can use there. Roboclock, um, this is teaching time. So we're getting into um, third grade now a little bit. So basic is based on the hour. Half is using half hours, quarters, quarter two, and then expert is all of the above. So when we're looking at this, okay, what is nine o'clock here? Okay, so then we keep moving. Uh, what is this nine o'clock, four o'clock? What is this? And you keep moving through it um, and it will kind of switch it up over time. It's not AM or PM, but it gets students start to think about and recognize different clocks um, to be able to move throughout um, this whole process. So level up, keep going, and then you'll keep track of your score. A nice little easy game. Um, here's weighing fruits. You can get into like fourth grade a little bit. Um, this is a great one because it talks about fruit recognizing this. You can say, okay, what is this? So for ELL students, if you talk about that, but then also reading scales, how do we read scales and weight? Um, these are pounds and ounces, right? So looking at this, which fruit weighs the most? So the grape is here, the banana is here, and the plum's there. We know that the banana is the heaviest weight. Same thing here, tomato. But then as you start leveling up, now we start to use multiple fruits. So if we know the strawberry weighs this much and with the plum on it, now it weighs this much, which is the heaviest, you know? So we know that this is only a fraction of what an apple would weigh. Um, so these are, again, getting into a little bit more complex um, narratives for the students to be able to solve, but it's an easy way for them to kind of use some measurement and data throughout the whole process. Um, which number? This is another game that talks out loud that says the number um it'll tell you sorry if it's incorrect you can't hear the volume but for me i can um so if you need them to repeat number is 30 million so it's written and it's also ready there so oh hey and then you get a bonus too for the correct answers so again ell students easy to be able to interact with um the the each of those different tasks that you have but another easy math um, activity then you have throw the ball fractions so this is uh, interesting game, I thought. There's a little bit of complexity as far as skill and then also equivalent fractions. So looking at this screen, there's two equivalent fractions that we have. We have four eighths and we had um, uh, five tenths. Those are equivalent to one another. So what you want to do is knock down the block. So you hold the left uh, um, clicker and then you would throw the ball to see if you can actually knock over <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, like I said, this is something that's a little bit different and challenging. So you got a little bit of dynamics there. Um, notice I gained points here. As I'm throwing the bullet, um, I lose five points for this. If I want a bigger ball, I can get a bigger ball, but I lose five, 10 points. So then you keep going until you get all the points valuable. And if you go on the left side, you'll notice you'll swing over to the other side to be able to go and get all the points you need. So I am able to go to the next level, but again, recognizing equivalent fractions is something a little bit different for students to be able to use. Um, you got prime numbers. Um, so this is an easy way for you to move back and forth in a boat and understand, okay, what are the different prime numbers here um, between zero and two? So if I lower down the hook and actually grab a fish, where what numbers am I grabbing? 
Um, and is it a prime number or not? Okay, yep, so we know that's a prime number. So what are some other prime numbers that we have? Oh, well, that's a composite number, right? So now let's look at some other numbers. Okay, well, seven uh, prime. Yep, there we go, there's a prime number. So then we have all these different numbers here. We have a score, we have lives. So just again, another interactive game that they could be using um, for that. And that's essentially what math nook is so if we're looking back on to um this right here math nook i gave you links again to all the different games that we played here i kind of went through them rather quickly but these are ways that you can use different math games okay so the next one that we're going to be able to use right now is math is fun this is kind of a nice i thought it was like an interactive puzzles um i'm i'm a big believer in problem solving and using um, critical thinking and problem solving. So math is fun. This is the main website that you'd have here broken up into different areas. You can search the different games. So what we're going to be using is broken calculator. I like this because it's a great way for students to start thinking about ways they can use calculators and how the function. So right now, these are the only functions that we have available to us on calculator. And we have to actually make these numbers happen. So in order to do this, six well, maybe we want to do three plus three. Oh, that's six. Okay, we got that. And notice we're getting time during this. Okay, how do we make seven? Well, maybe we do, you know, two plus two plus three. Um, well, that equals 40. Well, that doesn't work. All right, so now we have to reset. So notice that this kept on from our old answer. So we have to make sure if we're resetting, how does that work? And the reason why we want to keep that in mind is because there's a way strategies to be able to use this. So notice I got seven, right? So if we did plus three, now we got 10. And if we did plus two, we got 12. Then we did plus three, then we got 15. Then if we did plus three, plus two, then we got 20. And if we add them all up, we eventually get all of these. So there's different ways. Um, and you can ask students, well, can you use multiplication uh, to get this? If so, where? If you can use addition, um, how do you use that to equal these numbers? So there's a lot of different ways you can use broken calculator, and it's a fun way to have a little twist on a traditional calculator. Bulls and cows. This is a fun activity that it's, you know, based, it just kind of came up before uh, Mastermind, but it's on that same principle. So right here, bulls are truth, cows are false. So if I had numbers here, one, two, and three, if we say go, we know one is true. So if I change this to one, I change this to three, you can't have repeated numbers. We now that know that two are false. So we know that this wasn't correct to begin with. It was one of the zero or the one um, that we needed to be able to use um, to be able to go. So we know that now that isn't correct. So we know that one based on that information is correct. This one and this other one are the ones that are incorrect. So if we go there, now we know one, one. So if we go three, and four. Now we know two is correct. Well, maybe let's see if this is correct. Oh, look at that. Now we did well done. So this is another easy way to be able to strategize their intro games um, that you could be used with your students to kind of use some strategy and logical thinking. Um, this also ties into computer science. So it's a great way to systematically think. Um, Already agent. This is a great activity that you can use with younger students. So basically, using symmetry, looking at images, what are the differences between these? So if we look at this example, um, one of the things that I try to focus on is one element. So if we're looking at this cat, for example, uh, we want to find what is the one that looks exactly like this. So if we look, notice that these whiskers have three tags, that has two. So we know we've already eliminated two. Now let's look at these. What are difference between these two? Well, one's red, one's yellow. What is it? Well, it's red, so we can click on there. So this is a great way for students to kind of look and focus on that one kind of element that kind of differentiates it from the rest. Now, in this case, it's the eyebrows. Look at the eyebrows. Look, so we know this is incorrect. And we also know that this is incorrect. So we know it's one of these two. So what's the difference between these two? One ears is drooping and one's is not. So we know that's correct. So this is, again, another way for students to start thinking about symmetry and ways to differentiate. And then we could tie it into real world applications of forgery how does this actually relate in real world there's people that actually look at these details if you have difficulty during this time there's people that are study this and have good eye perception for that um, another game that we have here is called money master this is fun because i think it's a great way to be able to manipulate money in a unique way 
So for example, if we go to USA, your target change is $36. Now this is all the dollars that you can have. Now you can, there's currently ways that you can add up um, to this to see if we can actually get up to $36, okay? All right, so then we go to next, right? Um, you can have a target with totals or you can have a target without totals. Um, so, so basically meaning that as I'm going here, you can't see how much this really is. So there's ways to uh, make it more difficult. So there's handful and handful of no totals. And then if you give change, for example, so these are great ways to be able to use Money Master um, to be able to have this, to be able to manipulate coins. And there's also other games on here, um, not just Master Index, um, but uh, currencies of, I think it's this one that I'm looking for. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, da, 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 da. I, okay, so this is a fun way to also think of different ways of using money. So where target amount is $1, how many different ways can we find and make that $1? Now there's 293 ways um, to make $1 with the coins and the currency that we have over here. Um, so if we looked at this, oh, well, that's too much, right? So if we put this on there, yep, there's one way. Let's think of another way. So if we used four quarters uh, or two half dollars, I mean, or then we use two quarters and a half dollar, that's three ways. So we can ask students to have maybe come up with like 10 ways and then just write down all those possibilities and share those. What's also interesting though, is we can actually have other countries currency too. So for like this one, for instance, Hong Kong only has 11 ways to be able to make up $1. And if we look at this, oh, that's $10. So even though we don't know these currencies values, we can start to decide, oh, well, these are ways that we can actually start building these. So the second way would be, you know, build 50. Okay, so now we use two 50s. Now let's build it with just 20s and 50s. All right, so that's all the possibility there. So then we get into, okay, so now we've used all the 50s. Our, so now let's substitute it with all the 20s. Um, all right, okay, and then if we took off a 20, let's add a 10 and a 10 for that. Okay, well then we take it off. And so you can see how I'm kind of logically thinking throughout this whole process, but this is a great way for, um, students to be able to work through some of these different problems, right? Um, so this is not all the different strategies. So now I look, I've only had eight out of 11. So where did I go wrong, right? And then we can go back to that. So the Hong Kong would be a great one for students to see if they get all of them, but then in the USA, maybe come up with maybe uh, 10 to 20 different ways or depending on the level of your students to be able to use that. So again, math uh, games are great ways to uh, be able to use. And here's a couple of some different links that you can use for that. Um, so when you're using them, things to consider, you want to download and try to use an app or game before you use in the classroom, just to make sure you're familiar with it. Um, you want to take it from your student's perspective to see what they see, um, you know, what kind of problem it solves, what's the things they kind of create uh, when you need to solve. Um, what accompanying materials can you use in the classroom to extend on the lessons taught by this math game? Games are great to rich or complement learning, but it, remember, it's not to replace the lesson. And then after using the game, you know, how can your students continue learning? Whether they could continue to use the game at home? Um, is it pretty repetitive? Is it going to be able to, um, you know, be able to use over and over again? So, um, and then the last thing is, do you have to worry about ads, in-app purchases? Is it safe to navigate? Is the game compatible with, the devices you use, what are alternatives? So the sites that I gave you, some of them do have ads. Some of them are hard to navigate. So although you can give them the link, um, students can get out of the link really easily and start navigating all over the place, right? So you wanna really make sure that students, um, if you're using something that you understand there's are limitations to sometimes using free resources. But these are again, great ways that you can use um, different games and apps throughout these. and. And these are more of guidelines that get you thinking about what's important. When you ask yourself these kind of questions when trying out new games for your classroom, it can help you assess whether games or apps are a good fit for your classroom needs and if the app will continue or contribute uh, to your class um, learning uh, environment. So 
let's jump on to the next one. So I'm going to try to get into catch up on time. I think I kind of went a little bit too fast, but I, uh, or too slow on those last ones. But again, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of an array of low level all the way to fifth grade, different games that you can use. All right, so minute to win it strategy. This is based on the popular game show that took off in the early 2000s. Um, it aired live in the U.S. in 2010 and NBC, um, it, you know, but what you may not know is that this is a spinoff of Every Second Counts back in the 80s. The idea is that, you know, someone or a couple is challenged to complete a task in a minute. They would do so many rounds and then they would win money. You know, it was very popular. So getting students to participate or get excited can be difficult. Um, you know, this game like approach gets students interested, even for those that are just watching. It gets students thinking, you know, hey, can I do that? Can I try that? And they can test the skills of students. Um, and it could be a physical challenge or a uh, mental challenge or both. And it could be scaled up or down depending on the level of the students. The best part is, is that it's quick and you can fit it in your already overcrowded schedule. So for one, it forces students to use skills they wouldn't normally use. Oftentimes we're focusing on content knowledge, but students aren't always graded on communication, their collaboration skills or how they problem solve, et cetera. This changes that because you can have students work together as pairs or groups and students naturally use their engineer design cycle. And the best part is that you can tie it to the challenges content. So one of the examples that I give is the ABCs. So the, for example, everybody can do the ABCs, you know, beginning to end, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but can they do it backwards in a minute? Right, so that's an easy way to get students to start to really think about it. And normally, I would test you guys, but for time's sake, I'm not going to do that today because I got some other tests I want you to do. Um, this is some introduction activities that you can use with this concept. You know, you have the cookie challenge. Um, this is where you put the cookie on your forehead, and then without touching it, you have to use the face muscles and move your face um, or body to move the cookie into your mouth from your forehead. So this is a fun and interactive. Empty your junk challenge. So shake and bake, I like to call it. So basically tying, um, you know, a, a tissue box to the back uh, around your waist, and, and the box is actually behind you, and you have items in your tissue box and you have to kind of shake and groove to get all the objects out of your <laughs> tissue box. It's a fun interactive thing and it gets students really engaged with that. Transfer challenge. So you can use a straw and you can move um, things. I call it, can you eat this? So like using Smarties or some food that won't go up in a straw and then you've got to move them over to a plate and can you do that in a minute? Air challenge. I can't breathe. So using a balloon, can you Keep the balloon in the air with just breathing out loud, uh, just using your breath from one side to the other. So this is a fun challenge. Um, speed challenge, wax on, wax off. I, I think it's kind of fun because this is seeing if a student can use one arm behind their back, usually their non-dominant hand, and then using only their dominant hand to pull one tissue out at a time of a box and see if they can empty the whole tissue box in that one minute time. And you can do spin-offs, right? So this is this is more of a warm activities for the philosophy. You can alter these activities. For example, you could change the transfer game into using even and odd numbers. Students could pick up, you know, numbers on laminated cards and drop them off on even numbers on a plate to your right, and then maybe odd numbers on a plate to your left. Same tactics, just changing the something related to math instead of food. Um, so this is that's those are some great things. And there's different challenge types. Visual perception, um, word skills, critical thinking, coordination under logical puzzles. Um, and then there's also physical ch challenges where you're actually, you know, doing a relay race or checking your dominant versus your non-dominant um, senses, like your hand, your eyes, um, and also balance and coordination. So we're going to go into some of these. So this is a twist on suffixes and prefixes using pictures. Um, you know, can you put one picture to the left with the one... Um, uh, complete word on the right and each picture and word part may be only used once so spelling may not always be correct but pronunciation will be so I'm going to wait for about 30 seconds here and see if you guys can come up with some of the different answers All right, and usually you would say, hey, you got 10 more seconds, et cetera. So, um, but with sake of time, I'm gonna kind of give you the answer key here. So just as some things you can see, you know, you can see pumpkin, um, you can see the P with peaches, um, you know, you can see, um, uh, you can see the nectarines, 
brownie is probably one of the hardest. Um, gumbo, cabbage, and there's other variations that you can use as well. Um, you know, you can use pictures of landmarks, familiar areas, or vocabulary. Change the time limit. Um, you know, so it's it's okay. You know, and so again, this is a way for students to maybe you know critically think about something that they haven't done before to kind of get some visual perception skills um, done. Um, and then you also have math-related visual perceptions, right? So this is a disoriented floor design made with 400 tiles. Optical illusions are a great way um, to be getting students thinking about these um, challenges using photos, color schemes, architecture, et cetera. So this is, again, that one of those illusions, that floor isn't dipping down, it is flat, but is the optical illusion effect that we have. That's kind of really cool. Um, also, look at the circles to the right. Are, there, are they moving? If so, which ones? I'll kind of give you about 10 seconds to kind of look and kind of see what do you think. All right, we'll see if anybody has some answers um, to see if they think, is it A, is it B, C, D, E, F? Any combinations, all of them? <laughs> I, I kind of want to see what you think. All right, so we got uh, Crystal thinks they aren't moving. Carly thinks they're not moving. Um, all of them are moving, Patricia. Um, and <laughs> and no, this is this is very common. Um, there's a lot of mixed answers usually. Um, and the reason being is because there, there's a perception here. So the answer is actually none of them. And no, this isn't a GIF. Um, you know, so this is, the image was inspired by the famous illusion, rotating snakes created by a Japanese psychologist and professor. So it is an example of a peripheral drift illusion where the still image appears as if it is moving. Despite the swirling, um, and twirling that you think you see, this is actually a stagnant image. The human brain kind of processes information in a very basic way. As we move our eyes from light to left to right, we pick up visual cues both directly and in our peripheral vision that our brain then processes it kind of piece by piece, not continuously. So, and because our brains process high contrast elements like you know black on white faster than low co contrast ones like black on gray, that lapse in mental retime is ultimately what causes the apparent motion. So when you stare at one part of the photo without moving or blinking your eyes, there shouldn't be an, any motion. And it's kind of hard to do because when we tend to look at our peripherals, uh, but that we look through our peripherals, but you know, that's a little fun activity that you can use with students. And I also like doing this activity because it shows how math is related to science. A lot of people still believe math and science is separate, but they are actually one and the same. The reason is because math is the language of science. It's, it's how we explain any science phenomenon or the world around us. For example, gravity is visible and easy for students to kind of witness Newton's law, but it's much more different to explain it mathematically. When you're teaching math, you're also inadvertently teaching science, and it's just that people don't always realize it or think of it that way. So that's just something to think about um, when you're using, but that's a great activity that you can use. Also, world skill word skill challenges. This is a unique way or shift that you can use vocabulary um, for math. So basically, we're taking here and we're actually coming up with a path um, of words that you can use. So nest, turn, even, next, tent, tilt, uh, tuna, aurora, and then you kind of build all the way around. So this is a nice little puzzle that you can also use, uh, but I have some different variations of that as well. Um, Word hunt, unscramble the words, so letters, so like math, you can actually unscramble math and create actually 12 words. Um, I'm a, I'm, I, and just to prove it, I'm gonna show it to you. So these are all the different 12 words that you'd be able to use. And yes, Tam and Ta are words. Um, you know, ta, Tam is like a tight fitting Scottish cap and Ta is thanks. So even when you get questions about, hey, hey are those actually words? Yes, and they are recognized by the Scrabble too. So <laughs> just something to be aware of. Uh, fun little activities that you can do. Um, this is another challenge that this coordination challenge, our different challenge type. Um, classic, you know, start in one spot, you go only through one square once and you have to complete the challenge. You can do this with a kind of type of math. Um, so this is like using clock numbers, one to 12. You have to use it for every number twice to complete this puzzle. 
each number next to it above, below, right, or left. It needs to be one of the two numbers nearest on the clock face, except a separate by a may as well. So for example, one needs to be next to two. Five needs to be next to four or, or two, or you can't be anything else. Five could be next to four or six. Seven could be next to six or eight. And nine could be next to eight or 10. So you would go through this and try to figure out if you can solve this normally, I would allow you to do this, but for time's sake, unfortunately, I can't, don't have enough time. So this kind of gives you the puzzle to kind of think about if you want to use that activity as well. And this is something that's also tied to, to math is fun. Here's another minute to win it challenge that you can do. Um, here I gave you a hint. So using crossword numbers, right? So one across is add the digits of seven across. So you know that if you add the digits of seven across, it should equal 10. Um, and we'd be able to go through this process step by step um, once I gave you this hint. You can use this challenge if you want, but I did provide the answer as well. Um, I won't show you exactly right now. So if you later you wanna go back and try it, you can. Um, coordination challenges also. So this is using body language. So body language could be an also great coordination challenge because you can start talking about symmetry, angles, degrees, et cetera. So this challenge is focused on body language. We're spelling out a word with the whole body. Um, if you have a floor length mirror, it is helpful for this specific one. So the first letter that you're going to make is basically standing straight, feet together, facing the mirror. Hold your left arm out in front of you so it's perpendicular to your shoulder. Keeping your elbow next to your side, bend your arm so it forms a 90 degree angle with your shoulders and turn to your right side and record this letter. And eventually you would use the second letter, third letter, fourth letter, fifth letter. I'm going through this quickly again, because again, I want to be able to cover everything. And then you'd say, okay, what letter did you spell? Um, and then I'll let you do that activity. Um, but the letter that you, or the word that you should spell is fresh. So I'll see if you can figure that out on yourself. So another physical, so we just did mental challenges. Um, this is physical challenges. So these are ways that you can, strategies that you can use with students, um, this is just one example using like swim noodle, hula hoops, you know, softball and balls, rings, et cetera. And they're basically creating pool, right? And so for every ball that he hits in there into the ring, he gets 10 points. For every one he misses, he loses points. This is a minute to win it challenge and you can keep track of the point system is that it can be included in math. Or you could do variations of physical challenges, like if you want to throw rings, um, that's more of like a skills challenge that you can same concept from a certain distance, have the students measure out feet. Well, um, maybe they don't have a measuring yardstick. Well, how are you gonna measure out five feet? Well, you have feet, right, on your foot. Um, maybe you can use your shoe size to figure that out. So there's different ways for students to kind of think about those kind of distance and uh, creating those distances. And you can also use like hopscotch variation using like fractions, um, you know, decimals, place values, and then just giving them task cards to say, hey, you have to only touch, you know, equivalent fractions or, you know, um, you know, reduction, uh, reduce fractions, et cetera. Um, and then there's also statistics that you can use um, throughout these different physical challenges, you know, dominant versus non-dominant senses. So your left versus your right hand um, or your foot, um, your eyes, things like that. And statistically, what does your classroom have in as far as like dominance? Um, and this could be a physical challenge that the this, this students could do at home even, and then they can record that and send that information. And then you have a group of students uh, or a whole class with all statistics that you can do. So the all kinds of different minute to win it challenges that you can do with uh, your students. Things to different consider. Um, I definitely have those out there. Um, I think that they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, one thing I definitely want to make sure to focus on is that um, I always encourage safety um, and then look out for cheating if monitoring a large group if you're not physically present. So if you do anything online, like scramble words and things like that, students might look to cheat. Um, and then you don't want to let the competitive edge take over, right? This is fun and it's supposed to be engaging, but you don't want it to ruin the things for other students as well. So that's, so that's what I've um, kind of done for you today is kind of create a variety of different challenges and activities that are meant to be, you know, kind of done within one to three minutes and you can change the variety of this. Now, that being said, you can certainly make these activities longer or shorter, that's fine. But the idea is that you want to create quick, intense and engaging activities to make your students really focus for a short time span. And whenever I build these exercises, I focus on two elements, the time limit and the difficulty. They both are weighted equally whenever I'm trying to determine the outcome that I want to achieve. The other thing is great about the minute to win mentality is, is that it can be used 
um, and they can be adapted to other subjects, not just math, as you can see. So being elementary teachers, you can use this mentality and kind of transition to other subjects as well. Um, and then the last thing that we're going to be covering um, is knowledge hook. And this is a great, and this is a NASCO specific um, tool that we're going to be kind of focusing on. And I kind of wanted to do it because, again, it is free to access right now. Um, it is tailored for grades three to 12, but this is an easy way for you to get engaged uh, with students and it has game applications built right into it. Um, and you can use it for a lower grade level. So now typically you would sign up, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna log in as my teacher so you can kind of give an idea of what it is. And the nice thing is when you log in, you can sign in with Google so you don't have to sign in right away um, to make it very convenient um, to be able to sign in um, into your classroom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually have you guys participate with me um, right now. So there's going to be um, what we have here. So I'm gonna have Nelson's class here. And what I want you to do is you're gonna sign in with me and students could create their own account. So I'm gonna quickly have you sign in. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go to this website, you're gonna use this code, and then you're going to press create account. And then, so when you create account, um, you choose a password, very easy, like one, two, three, ABC, something very convenient. This isn't going to be something that you're going to be tested on or anything like that. Um, but this is just to quickly get you engaged with something that I can show you how that students would be able to use this content. Um, so again, joinkh.com, use this code top9528, create your account, choose your password, um, and then um, we'll get this this going here. So I, what I'll do is I will basically use this little clip here to make sure that this is still on the screen and accessible. Um, and But I wanna make sure to keep the progress, keep going um, throughout this whole thing here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit next and I'm gonna see the students, you're gonna see people kind of log in as you're kind of creating an account. Um, this is a great way to be able to students, and again, you gotta go to joincage.com top 9528, create your account, choose your password and hit next. And what I'll do is I will hit refresh and you should begin to see some people start coming into my, um, this classroom. So now I, yep, I've got a couple more people in here, which is great. Um, again, you're creating accounts, join kh.com, enter my password top, all lowercase 9528 and create your account. Um, and then what I'm going to do is what you should see is something similar to this. Now, I have experience um, here. I want you to click on the kickoff pre-assessment lesson. There should be two lessons in there. Um, this one is going to kind of give you an idea that this is a way to work with students to strategize on where they're at at first. This is your pre-assessment to say, OK, if students are needed to learn, um, um, this is the learning goals that we're going to be able to do. And you, you can go through this process right now with me too, or you're on your own pace. So how much of this rectangle is colored? So we have one, two, three, four out of six, uh, four out of there is, and then we'll say, oh yes, this is correct. Okay. We try again. Now, if, if for instance, we were to struggle with anything, how much is the shape is blue. Maybe we said it was two out of there. Well, no, not quite. Try again. What if one out of the blue? You know what? Keep trying. Every accomplishment starts with a decision to try. So we want to get students to think that just because you got the wrong answer does mean you give up. You can keep retrying over and over again. And that's that's part of the process of learning um, is through failure as well. So you can either continue on or you can retry the same different one. When you hit retry, now it's going to switch your question up. So it's a great way for you to kind of see um, how this actually keeps students honest and that they're not going to be using the same thing over and over again. Another thing is that you can report a problem if you're having difficulty seeing this. There's hints that you can use to be able to work through this problem. There's calculators. And then there's also take it up. This allows you to ask the question to the teacher saying, hey, I'm really having trouble with this. Can we, you know, answer this as a class, this specifically? It kind of gets students to really take ownership of their learning to be able to work through this answer. So if you want to exit, you can go back out. Um, as you gain and answer different questions, you're going to notice that you're starting to get stars um, and some of these other different power-ups. So it has a game-like mentality that you're 
gaining experience to level up. So it has that easy mentality. And so when you're all done, you can actually go back to your very beginning page um, and you can see how much you actually achieved of this. Um, there's also different things that you can get exclusive bot. There's also different activities that I can add as well. And these, and then the nice thing too is you also get gifts to send. So the more experience you get, you can actually work with other students to be able to send them gifts and different activities. So Bobby J is kind of my go-to fake account um, that I use to kind of show you the student side of things. So Bobby, if I go into the classroom side, I could say, okay, he's got 15 questions completed. He's earned five stars, fourth grade. Um, this is his display name. This is his username. This I can reset his password if needed. How far has he completed? Um, has he played any game shows? We're going to play that in a minute. But then we can look at a report specifically to see, okay, what kind of questions is he having troubles with, right? So, um, you know, and these are all the names that are hidden. Um, this is just, you know, example of, you know, you can click here for multiple tries to say, okay, look, his first score was five out of six, but his best scores was six out of six because he retried again. And this is how many questions that he was able to complete. And this is this is ways that you can also keep track of everybody else too throughout this process. So some of you are going through this game, which is great. And you can kind of see whether or not you're correct or not. Um, you can download the results, you can measure growth, you can send them to the parents. Um, you can view a sample of this if you want. So this is a great way that this is all free for you to access once you start building a classroom. Now, the benefit of this too is, now we can start looking at ways that we can start making other games and have fun with this too. So let's go into our fourth grade class. Um, we're going to be, now we have a variety of other people answering on here, which is great. Um, we're going to go into activities. So if we go into activities, this is all the content you have, and this is your legend. So if you wanna teach about geometry, measurement of data, number of operations, um, base 10, operation geometry thinking, and you can kind of surf through it. You can go by grade level if you want. So let's say, let's go by fourth grade and we're going to get into, you know, visual math, all right? So now we can kind of select what kind of thing we wanna do. We just did a self-paced mission. So that self-paced mission um, is what this is right here, the self-paced mission. This is a pre -service. this is your kickoff mission. So this is to get students thinking, okay, where are they are currently? to start doing the self-paced mission. So if we wanted to do self-paced mission, that's what that is. But we're gonna play a game show. And now what you're gonna do is, this is setting up a game show where students can actually start to think. So we wanna select capture critical thinking, yes. We want it to be collaborative or competitive. Let's do competitive and have a, or actually no, let's do collaborative as a team. I wanna see that as a class, we're making at least 50% of the students making it. Uh, if we want to change that, we can change it up to 75. It depends what your benchmarks are. And there's also a, um, open settings here too. So registration open means anybody can join or you can close it to outsiders. Um, allow guests to play. Yep. Because even if you're not in my classroom, I'm allowed to play. Show benchmarks. Absolutely. And then tiebreaker. This is nice if there's a time or everybody has the same score. Whoever completed it the fastest is going to be able to do this. Now we can invite students. So same thing. Now, if you go to your same count, you'll notice that, hey, there's a live game showing up. So this is my student count. So if you wanna join that game right now, we can start to begin and we can start to see who's all involved with this. So I've gotten some other people involved. Um, looks like others are haven't joined yet. We're gonna wait for a little bit for this to be able to join real quickly, just to kind of get people into it again. In your student account, you can start right into there. Um, for the sake of time, we're at noon. So let's just start this game. So just kind of give you an idea of what this is like. So we got seven people locked in. We have three questions for this um, different topic right here. Um, and it's going to begin. So how many straight lines are needed to draw a triangle? So this is the same thing. So this is my vision, this teacher vision. This is the student vision. So if we look at here, how many straight lines that we can see? Use the button arrows on the bottom of your screen. So if we go up or down, how many straight lines do you need to draw a triangle? So let's let's submit and see if that's, and we don't know if that's correct yet. Um, so we're gonna wait for that to load.
We got 18 out of 32 locked in. So everybody, let's see how many people. So we got 27 out of 32 locked in. Let's see if we got 28. Let's see if everybody else is going to be locked in here. 29. All right, 30. Um, and then we could say, hey, you know what? We want to end the question, even though some other people are locked in. Oh, look at that. We had 100% people answer correct. So then we'd go to the next question. Hey, over 50% got the class right. Remember that percentage? Woohoo! Hashtag class win. Awesome. Good job. You know, so now we're going to the second question. And then you get experience if you get it correct. So then we would continue playing this throughout this whole game show. So this is the easy way to get students to um, get them to use all this. And then you can continue to feedback if you wanted. You can add comments if you want. Um, hashtag 10. And then you get an overall report of this as well. So now, again, I kind of went it through a little bit quickly. Um, Knowledge Hook is definitely an integrated guidance system to help students. As you can see, it talks about performance. But again, it's a free accessible tool that you can use and sign up for classroom. It's very easy to set up classes. Um, all you have to do is create a class. You can use your import your Google Classrooms. You can do a, a name, Mr. Nelson's math class, you know, grade three. You can select your grade level or you can do multiple grades if you want. You hit continue. Um, we're not at a premium. This is for uh, actual, but with the game show and everything else that you need, it's all free. Even all this content on there, the premium Basically, what that does is takes it to the next uh, level of reports to analytics. So once you have the assessment tools and all this reporting, what are the next steps? That would be your premium content. But all this other content is free for you to use. All these activities, the visual math, the geometry, these are all pre-made for you to be able to get students starting to think about um, different activities. And you can combine activities and things of that nature. So again, this is a really nice tool that actually offers a lot more capabilities than any other tool out there currently for math because it's so versatile. And, and you can use it right out of, um, you can select the classmates and give them tools if you want, but right out of the box. So again, that's Knowledge Hook in a nutshell. I kind of went over it a little bit quickly, but um, I kind of wanted you to at least kind of see what it was about and ways that you can use it into the classroom. Um, so, that's the end of our presentation. Again, um, yes, Knowledge Hook is free, uh, Susan, for you to be able to use. Um, and you can use this at any given time. It's geared for grades 3 to 12, but you can use it for lower grades as well. Um, it, and it's a very nice interactive tool. And I could give more one-on-one -on -one instruction if you want. You can reach out to me at engage at nascoeducation.com if you want to follow up from this. But essentially, that's the end of the presentation. I want to leave some time for questions. Um, it was a fast and furious, but, um, but again, this is, was to be able to connect you some additional information, even if it was one hour, NASCAR Education is here to help you, not only now, but to get you training and afterward support for the rest of the school year. But we really want to be your partner for future years and make sure you have everything that you need. And we have a variety of different resources and tools that can assist with those needs. So a lot of them are located on NASCAR Educator Resource Center, but in this case, Knowledge Hook is a great resource ready for you to use right now, along with some of those other different games and apps, and on the minute to win it strategy or mentality as well, or philosophy. So um, can you play the games on Knowledge Hook in Zoom? Absolutely, yeah, it, it's browser-based. So if you're presenting in Zoom, you can show exactly what you're doing. Um, or like I said, in the game show, if you're presenting, Mary, um, you can see exactly what the students are seeing. Create a dummy student account and just kind of visualize too and kind of work through that as well. Um, they should be able to work through that. And you can have Zoom up just in case students get lost or don't know how to answer questions. So any kind of deliverable video communication tool you can use to be able to communicate with Knowledge Hook. Um, yes, there is going to be a certificate after the webinar. It's going to be in the follow-up with the survey too, um, with the presentation. Um, the survey is going to be right after the webinar, excuse me, but then there's also going to be um, uh, the recording video and the certificate that follows up after this, about an hour after this. So right around, you know, 1.15, I would look in your inbox to see and make sure that you have the recording and the certificate for that as well. So 
Is there any other questions that I might have? Again, I apologize for how quick I went through. I did push through a lot of content to you, but you'll have the recording for this. And then you'll be able to also go over the speed of my presentation in, in slow motion um, or slower to be able to digest a lot of what I did. Because again, I wanted to maximize your time and that was for why I went the speed that I did. So any other questions that maybe you want me to actually uh, answer? Thank you for information. Bunk game, a calendar is off and I missed the whole lesson. Can I get slides? Kimberly uh, and Heidi, yes, uh, you can get the slides. Um, I'm gonna be doing a follow-up email personally to everybody that's here today, just to make sure they have the slides. So uh, shoot out to me at engageandaskeducation.com um, if you don't get the slides within this week. Um, and then that way I make sure you have everything that you need. All right, thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Julie, for participating. Thanks everybody for joining me today. Um, I don't think I missed, or maybe I might have missed some questions here. Let me just double check. Um, username and login. Yep, great. We covered that. Do I just join as a guest or create an account? You can join as a guest or create an account, either one. Um, yeah, so I think I did cover everything. Uh, I'm looking at more again. All right. So, yes, again, thank you for coming, participating. Definitely enjoyed you participating with me today. I, I, I think there's a lot of great tools that you can use um, and have fun with this. Games is a lot of great, it's a great way to interact with students um, and there's a lot of good applications for that. So have fun with this um, and take care.